Hello, my name is Sascha Peibisch and today I would like, like to talk about the RFC 9449 or 2 demonstrating proof of possession. This is relatively new, it was finalized in uh, summer 2023 and I would like to explain what it is and how it works. Here are a few highlights. Depop, as uh, the short term uh, is called, binds a token to the client that requested it. These types of tokens are called sender constraint token and it means that only this client that requested the token can use the token. Depop is one of two methods for this purpose in FARP2 security profile, Financial APIs 2.0 security profile. If your intention is to build a relying party in the context of open banking, you may want to look into FARP2 and you'll find two methods for sender constraint token and Depop is one of those. Depop proofs are presented as a JSON web token and I'll show that later. Depop support can be added to an authorization server without breaking existing relying parties. So this extension uh, can be added and your existing clients will still work with no issues whatsoever. And Depop can also be added to a relying party with relatively small effort. So it's not hard to update your client in order to support Depop. Overall, the whole idea of Depop is to protect an authorization code, an access token, or refresh token against misuse. Whenever you fear that one of these may leak during a flow because of your client setup or environment, Depop will prevent a leaked access token from being usable by an unauthorized client. And in this presentation, I will highlight the role of the relying party to enable you to update your existing client to work with Depop. So let's get started. <coughs> the slide is called Depop Jock, uh, JWK, JSON WebKey, and I'll explain why. So first of all, in order to find out if the authorization server supports Depop, you may want to download the uh, well-known OpenID configuration or the OAuth metadata endpoint. And the server will expose a key called Depop signing alg value supported. It's an area of algorithms that are supported in the context of Depop. And if you find that value, this server is supporting Depop. And if you find this value, your client has to generate a key pair which is shown on this side, on the left-hand side, in a JSON web key format, and it has to match at least one of those algorithms that were listed uh, by the server. In addition, your client may register with a server in order to let the server know that your client will always, um, or only sometimes, uh, request Depop bound access tokens. So if you are sending this registration value setting true, your client always has to use Depop. Uh, no other requests will be accepted by the authorization server. And in most cases, these servers will have a UI that allow you to set a checkbox or something similar in order to uh, uh, include this information as part of your client registration. So this is the first step. Your client has to be able to generate and manage a JSON web key. Secondly, your client has to be able to generate a Depop proof. The G Depop proof is a JSON web token and whenever you need it, it has to be included as an HTTP header called Depop. So Depop and then your Depop proof, which is the JSON web token. And it has to be signed by the private key of the key pair you generated for this purpose. Now, the header of this JSON web token, the JOT header, will include these values, type algorithm JWK. And the first specific piece here is the type, which is DPOP plus JOT. So that has to be configured um, uh, whenever this JSON web token represents a Depop value or a Depop proof. In addition, the public key 
presented in the uh, JSON web key format has to be included. And this JSON header will basically stay the same until uh, your client uses a new key pair. The second part, the JSON payload, however, is specific to a request. You may see here there's a JSON Web Token ID, which is unique per request or per DPOP proof that you're generating. You have to include the DPOP, uh, the uh, HTTP method, like post, get, put, whatever it is. The URL that is um, intended with this uh, DPOP proof, the recipient of this DPOP proof. So in this, this example could be the token endpoint of an authorization server and a issued at timestamp in seconds. These four values have to be included for each single DPOP proof that is being generated. There are two optional values. The first one is nonce. Nonce is a value that is provided by the authorization server, and we'll see that in a moment. So if your client sends a request, for example, to this endpoint, it could happen that the server returns an error, and the error will include a header, a DPOP nonce, and then your client has to repeat this request and including this value as a nonce in its DPOP proof payload. And if this DPOP proof is used against the resource server, the uh, SHA-256 value of or hash value of the access token that is being used with this request has to be included also. And down here is a little list of these values to for you to read afterwards or later what they mean. So now, this is uh, the first piece your client has to be able to do. The second one is a JSON web key thumbprint. So as you know, in, auth in an authorization code flow, which works with a redirect, you will not be able to set a header and therefore, alternatively, you can set a parameter as an additional authorization request parameter. Here, for example, we've got the response type as usual. And in addition, for this protocol, you may add dpop underscore jkt, the JSON web key thumbprint. And it's the base64 encoded value of the SHA-256 value of the public key. And if you do this, the authorization code will, also, will already be bound to your client so even if that leaks, it can only be used by this client. And then afterwards, the token request and the resource request can also only be successfully executed if, in the end, this value is still valid throughout the whole flow. So the uh, general way to generate this uh, thumbprint is very easy. Your base64 URL encode the SHA-56 uh, value of the uh, public key of your JSON web key. And when you look at base64 URL, uh, the difference to plain base64 encoding is that you will not include any padding characters like a equal sign. And if you are using a library like uh, JOSY4J, there's a very simple method, calculate base64 URL encoded thumbprint. And I'm bringing this up because most libraries will have a, a method like this, so it's very easy to uh, implement and support. So those are the main pieces that your client has to be able to generate. Now, once you get started, there are certain responses that you have to take care of, and you have to know that they may be slightly different than your usual OAuth responses. Let's say the OAuth flow went well and the OAuth server sends a 200 OK message, including the token response. The access token, token type, expires in, refresh token, as usual. But you will find that the token type is now set to DPOP instead of bearer, as you usually know it. And if the access token is a JSON web token, if you open it up, you will find that it will 
have um, the JSON web key thumbprint included as a confirmation method. In this case, the server generated this value, and this way the access token is bound to this public key uh, having this thumbprint. And if it's not a JSON web token, if it's just a string, then the authorization server will still generate this value keep it in its database for this session, and the uh, uh, introspection endpoint will be able to return that value. Now, the uh, most common error response will not be an error like invalid deep or proof or things like that. They will always happen, but they will most likely only happen while you develop your code and you figure out how things work. Uh, or then in production, maybe if you change a, a, uh, your, your key pair, you may have those errors. But the most common one will be this one, an error message saying use depop nonce. And this means the server denied your request because it wants your client to include a depop nonce value. So your client is receiving this error message, including depop nonce, which is a header, HTTP header. And what you'll have to do is take this value, regenerate a depop proof, include this value as a nonce, as I've shown on the earlier uh, slide, and then you repeat the request and it will be successful. Resource servers may also return an error so for once, of course, they will return a success message with uh, the requested resource. But they may also require your client to include a, um, a depop nonce value. So resource servers will return a 401 unauthorized error, including the www authenticate header with a message depop error use depop nonce. And they will also return the uh, depop nonce as a header value. And it's the same story as for the authorization server. Your client has to pick up the nonce value, regenerate the depop proof, include the nonce, send the request again, and it will all work. The others could be uh, an unauthorized request because the depop header was uh, completely missing, or the uh, thumbprint that was found within the access token didn't match the public key that was used with this depop proof. But those two are most likely ones that don't happen too often and you just need to be able to know that they'll happen. This one, however, can uh, occur often. Now let's have a look at the protocol. So depop mainly covers these endpoints, the authorization endpoint, the pushed authorization endpoint, the token endpoint, and the resource server, a user info endpoint. And this is just an example. It could certainly be any resource endpoint on this resource server. So if you want to start early in the DPOP protocol, you'll start off with the authorization request. If you do the let's say, ordinary authorization request, you will create your query parameters, and you'll include the depop JKT, as I showed earlier, the thumbprint of your public key. If your intention is to start off with the pushed authorization request, you can create the same query URL, but you also have to include the depop header, which is the JSON web token. So you'll, you'll generate it, You'll call the uh, pushed authorization endpoint and um, you continue the flow. So the token endpoint is the same thing. You generate the depop proof. You include your parameters in your payload, which could be for the authorization code grant or for the refresh grant or any other that are valid. And then of course, Calling the user info endpoint, you'll include the access token. But this time, since the token type is depop and not bearer, you have to make sure you include the token type depop with your issued access token. 
And then, of course, in addition, the deeper proof. And for these lower three endpoints, you have to prepare your client to receive the uh, use depop nonce error that I mentioned beforehand. So whenever you make this call or this one or that one, you may get an error saying include the depop nonce and you'll have to be able to repair the request, uh, repeat the request. And this is basically what you can do with a depop. Now, I'm going to show you how all of this ties an access token to the initial client. So the client has a private key and a public key, and the client will generate a depop proof. The depop proof includes the public key, as we saw earlier, as the JSON web key, and it will sign this depop proof using its private key. It will then send an authorization request to the authorization server, including the depop proof. The server will open it up, it will extract the public key, and it will verify the signature of the depop proof. If that is valid, it will generate an access token, and it will include, if it's a JSON web token based access token, or will remember the JKT, the hash value of the of the public key as we um, did it earlier, as I showed you earlier. So now this access token is bound to this public key and this public key is uh, basically bound to this private key. Now the access token is sent back to the client and the client will send the access token to the resource server in order to consume a protected resource. The resource server will do the same. It will verify the DPOP signature but it will also verify the access token signature. And if the resource server is happy with those two signatures, it will extract the JSON web key thumbprints, the one that is included or was included in the access token, and the other one generated um, based of the public key that was found in the DPOP proof. And if those two are the same, then uh, they have to both be bound to the same public key and therefore to the same private key and therefore to the same client. And the connection looks something like this. The resource server trusts an authorization server. So when the resource server verifies the, the signature of the access token, it will make sure it was issued by the trusted authorization server the access token was bound to the public key and the public key is bound to the private key. So therefore, um, this must be the client that initially requested the authorization code and then the access token and then used the access token against the protected resource. I hope that makes sense. So to summarize all of this, if you want to support Depop in your client, Make sure you generate a new DPOP proof for each single request. Don't reuse your DPOP request or DPOP proof. Uh, um, if you create a new one per request, uh, you will prevent replay attacks. Um, and replay uh, attacks are especially mentioned in the FAPI2 security profile. So it's recommended that you don't reuse your deeper proof, simply generate a new one. Prepare your client to repeat requests after receiving a depop nonce, uh, use depop nonce error, as I mentioned before. And um, since you are doing depop, start the flow as early as possible, include the depop JKT parameter in your initial authorization request. When you're doing the, the uh, pushed authorization request, you can still include it as I showed it. It doesn't hurt. The server will make sure that uh, the uh, value that is included in this parameter matches the generated hash value of the public key that is included in the DPOP uh, proof itself. You should use DPOP whenever the server supports it. This makes your system just uh, more secure. And when receiving a DPOP nonce, uh, make sure you assign it 
or associated with a domain that issued the DPOP nonce. So let's say your authorization server is a server that issues its own DPOP nonce value uh, for its authorization flow, so to say, but issues access token that live on a different domain. So what could happen is you receive a DPOP nonce value of the authorization server, then you make a call to the resource server and you preemptively include the nonce value that you had received. Now this nonce value is most likely unusable and unknown on the uh, resource server. So when you receive a DPOP nonce, remember who issued it and only use it against that issuing party. So here are a few links. One is uh, to the DPOP RFC itself, to the Financial API security profile, and the JSON web key spec. Jossi4j is the Java library, which makes it easy to work with uh, JSON web token, JSON web keys. And Jotpal is a tool that allows you to uh, inspect a uh, JSON web token very easily. Yeah, thanks uh, for watching. Leave a comment with questions. I like reading questions and answering them. Uh, if you feel this is a really useful video, visit Buy Me A Coffee. And if you are into the API development, you may want to check out my book. Have a good day.